and uh, we're going to have a colleague of us from Mafi Code. I'm very happy to introduce now Dan Grodon Glavin. He's a DevOps consultant in Mafi Code, and he will talk about culture as a service. So Dan, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have prepared a talk for, for you guys, and I'm calling it Culture as a Service, uh, which I'm here to present to you today. It's actually a radical new product, a new offer, a new service uh, that, to my knowledge, is quite unique uh, in the marketplace of uh, promising offerings uh, to enterprises that more or less accidentally is bound to do business in the digital domain. My idea, culture as a service, uh, was actually inspired by the fact that most, uh, almost everything today can be bought as a service. Uh, so why not take something as insane as company culture and, uh, and productize uh, this Okay, so here's the pitch. Let's 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 go. Company culture is much more important now than it has ever been before. Companies with poorly defined uh, culture and value experience much lower employee net promoter score, and have a harder time attracting and retaining talent compared to their peers uh, with a stronger culture. At the same time, a lot of companies are struggling with uh, to define and come to agreement with what their culture is and what their core what value should be. And why, you may ask, because it's hard, it's time consuming, and it requires a lot of discussion and collaboration across the organization. Moreover, working with culture is not directly aligned with generating revenue. So it's difficult to justify the efforts, uh, for example, to the board uh, and to the shareholders. But it doesn't have to be pain and wasteful. In fact, you can leave all the, uh, the boring culture work to us and reap uh, all the benefits uh, by simply choosing one of our three culture plans that best feature and need. So first up, we got the silver plan. You get access to our call valve, our renowned culture as a service platform. We'll provide you with three handpicked, carefully chosen uh, values, carefully chosen to match your organization and industry. On the goal plan, here you will get access to our culture compliance service. Make sure that your employees act in compliance with your culture and values. The Platinum Plan is our most popular plan. This is the plan will, uh, that will take your organization to a whole new level. Here you'll get dedicated guidance from our culture coach experts and support from our uh, and support from them. We'll also ensure that talent is filtered through our compatibility program. This means that you will only hire and retain the very best of resources. And then last, we have the Platinum Plus. Every service on your server as a service. So this is your chance to join the culture of the lead. And our company the name is Culbrit. So stop thinking about culture and start thinking about business. So that's 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 the that's the that's the pitch. I mean you must be pretty excited as potential investors or customers right now, right? Culbrit of course being the concatenation of culture and brittle because that is what it is. <clears throat> so what about the idea? Is it good? I believe so. Yes, definitely. It's an idea that could be made very profitable. There will always be a steady demand for these silver bullets in my, in my knowledge. Is it bad? Yes, I believe so. It's snake oil. Culture can, of course, not be outsourced, just that you can't outsource responsibility for your words and actions. We tend to gravitate to the easy solutions. We just want to buy the digital transformation and be done with it, right? But time and time again, the industry has shown that this is doomed to fail. And of course, is it ugly? Yes, culture is hard and there are no shortcuts. However, I believe that if we are aware of the anti-patterns and enablers, improvements are always uh, sustainable. <clears throat> so first up, let's try to see how we can define company culture. Um, I believe that it's the behavior that we do, what we celebrate and promote, what we allow and disallow, and the behavior that we actually also ignore. Um, it's how big the gap is between what we say and what we do, and are they in kind of a conflict there, and how big is the conflict there? We probably all experience the, the feeling of kind of fakeness when they, don't, when they are in conflict, right? And I will also address the business case a bit here. So does it matter? Is it really core to us? And I believe, yes, it is the foundation for any company that wants to uh, thrive in the age of 
digital and software. So let me elaborate just a bit to get us on the same page here. So we're talking about companies that create some kind of value to external uh, customers or users through software here. There might also be other deliveries such as physical goods or other services, but for now, let's just focus on software. So working with software means that we are in the complex domain here. We are working, with complex, uh, we are working within complex social constructs. We are working with complex technology, and uh, we are delivering to a complex market uh, where demand changes rapidly and where today's uh, novel solutions quickly will be tomorrow's legacy. So in order for us to continuously deliver the best value, we need to have fast flow from idea to production. In other words, we need to apply lean practices built on lean principles. This is, in fact, not new knowledge. This is the first way of DevOps, according to Gene Kim and his seminal work, his book, The Phoenix Project, where we are taught that we should be considering flow and system thinking. We should be eliminating or lean waste or drudgery. We should be working in small batches for several reasons, including risks. We should limit our work in progress uh, to reduce context switches, create quality at the source to avoid any unnecessary work, and constantly optimize by exploiting our bottlenecks and reduce wait time and queues and so on. We need that in order for us to get early and often feedback from production. This is uh, not new. This is the second way of DevOps where we seek to amplify and shorten our feedback loops. Feedback is the only way we can learn what happens in production, being, be, be it both uh, performance and functionality, but also how our users are using our product. We need to open up for these opportunities for learning. And learning is the third way of DevOps. So it's about creating culture that fosters two things. We want continual experimentation that is taking risks and learning from our failures. And we want to understand that repetition and practice are prerequisites to mastery. So for us to constantly improve whatever we produce, we need to dare to experiment. We need a culture where we feel it's safe to fail, where failure leads to inquiry instead of blaming each other, where New experiments uh, are welcome and novel thoughts are implemented and not seen as something that threatens our current world, uh, view of the world. Where we actually train and encourage people to bring, bring bad news rather than hide it until it's too late, too late to act upon. Where we take responsibility for more than just what's in our silo or vicinity. And Speaking of silos, where we deliberately break down the right silos and share knowledge uh, broadly across the organization. This is from Westrum's organization, culture, and his typology, uh, typology as uh, Mark, my colleague, also talked about in his keynote. Uh, from his research, we have these three styles of climates. And according to Westrum, they are shaped by what the leaders are preoccupied with. So the first one is the pathological one, where uh, we are preoccupied with personal power, personal needs, and personal glory. So we are uh, power-oriented in this one. The second one, we are uh, 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 preoccupied with the, um, it's the bureaucratic style, where we are preoccupied with rules and position and departmental turf. So that's the, the rule-oriented one. And the third one is the generative one. That is the one that we want to be in. It's focused on the mission itself. We are performance oriented here, as opposed to concentrating on persons or positions. So these preferences create recognizable climate that affect uh, how our companies process information and other cognitive uh, activities. So company culture is predictive uh, on our software delivery capabilities. We learned that from the aura and state of DevOps reports, uh, and also our organizational culture. So to emphasize, we don't do this for the sake of Agile or Lean or DevOps. They are means to an end. It's not altruism this here. We do it to solve user needs because that's how we earn the right to stay in business. And I'm actually happy to see that the, the poll today that uh, we are actually also, uh, the crowd here, we are actually also concerned about culture. We, we Dominic had this poll here uh, earlier today where we can see that it's on our minds as well. So 
let me take you to where I see some of the underinvestments uh, today and where we are still struggling a bit in terms of culture. Um, psychological safety first. I like to start with this quote here. The culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior of the leaders willing to tolerate. And I like to start with a story from my own career. So I remember when I got fresh out of university and landed my first job uh, as an embedded engineer. Um, it was just around the financial crisis back in 2008. The unemployment rate for newly grads were already on a rise. So I was, of course, super happy that I managed to get a job despite that I required a bit of commute uh, at that time. I was also nervous because school is one thing, but how would it be in the real world? Uh, would I suffice? Would my skills uh, be enough? Uh, I had that kind of insecurity. So I was on this team with a guy that felt that he had the right to bully his surroundings if anyone didn't agree with his um, solutions or approach to a problem. Uh, I remember he would come to one's desk and loudly challenge uh, your knowledge and uh, my knowledge in the area that he, of course, had under his skin to, 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 the, to the sound from all the colleagues. He was actually a total jerk, while at the same time super brilliant. Uh, he was a real asset to the company. So, in fact, his behavior was tolerated despite uh, our managers uh, being fully aware of the negative impact uh, that he had on his surroundings. And was, not just me. And countless times I have witnessed uh, the, how this attitude and behavior of such brilliant jerks is capable of ripping apart teams. Uh, imagine how it limits creative thinking and teamwork and how it stops any kind of experiments that we do. And we need those in order to be able to fail in a safe manner. Mm, I still think I rarely see companies actually take responsibility for not promoting such behavior or in fact get rid of them. And it's kind of crazy when we know that who is on a team matters less than how the team members interact and how they structure the work and, how, and view their contributions. We learned that from Julie Rosowski being an analyst from Google. Uh, and contrary to what they actually anticipated, it's not the competence that was the biggest uh, contributor, but psychological safety. So. I don't believe it's about skills. It's also about skills, but it's more about psychological safety. Contribution, contributions from a team enjoying psychological safety will always outcompete contributions of the most brilliant uh, guy on, or girl on the team. So let me take you to the next one, the disregard for improvement work. Uh, when I talk to people in companies across industries and sectors, they often uh, express being knee deep in problems. Um, there might be a multitude of some symptoms related to, for example, delivery performance, uh, quality, stability, teamwork, architecture, whatever. But to me, it often boils down to not having had timely attention to continuously improving their work. So it often starts with a statement of being too busy to be able to improve, right? We are too busy. So I would normally ask the question whether they actually want to improve their ways of working. It seems like a simple question, but if they clearly express not to, then we're probably wasting each other time. Luckily, this is rarely the case because they contact us for a reason, right? So I would normally ask them to identify which work they currently are doing that they either could stop doing or put down prioritize for a period. And why is that important? Well, because teams normally are already utilized 100% and typically with feature work. So asking them to be really explicit about what not to do, I seek to make room for this kind of improvement work. And I want to make sure that it frees up enough time to have a lasting impact for them. So from the DevOps handbook, I believe that Jane Kim talks about that it should be around 20% of team time. Uh, to do this kind of work here in order to have some impact. And if not, I believe that we are back to where we started. Do we actually want to change the ways we work? But say that we have figured out the work, kind of work that we could not do in order to achieve like 20% of time to do improvement work. I would ask, do you have the mandate and support to move this kind of work um, with your stakeholders? 
And this might actually be hard because there are someone around a team or whoever needs this improvement that expects something from them today and needs to have another expectation tomorrow. So then there might be politics and different turfs coming back to bureaucratic organizations here. Again, get the mandate and the support. And if so, okay, then let's go. Then we're ready to actually do some kind of improvement. So to me, it's all about priorities. If we say yes to new work, there's something that we need to say no to, and we are not very good at that. It doesn't need to be hard to figure out how to start out. Use Mondays for this. It's very deliberately that, I, that it needs to be Monday. Uh, this is where we are uh, the most energized. It's not midweek because we already have established a rhythm that we might interrupt. It's not Fridays. We're probably already fully booked with meetings uh, or leaning into the weekend. It needs to be Mondays. And as a, as a bonus here, Mondays won't talk so much anymore. So this is actually uh, something that I saw my amazing colleague Christian did at a, at a customer we worked together with. And it was amazing to see how their teams suddenly had uh, another level of satisfaction uh, just because uh, they were capable of having 20% of the time that they could uh, decide for themselves. So let the teams decide on this. It goes without saying meetings are of course not allowed on Mondays. As the leader or manager, show interest in what kind of improvements they succeed with, perhaps even hold them a bit accountable for doing their uh, improvement work. And celebrate as much as you would have done with a regular uh, work here when they achieve something. And we also need to stop about maximizing utilization. If we want to, uh, to have these creative thoughts to spark, we need to introduce some kind of slack in our teams and set our brains free to come up with stupid or brilliant ideas here. So it's not about business. It's a, pri it's a priority question, this one here. Is the capability to say no and reprioritize. I also like to share a pattern that I see very often. So in this organization, example.org, we have four similar teams. They are suffering from many common problems, such as having too much manual work and therefore want to have more, for example, CI, CD uh, automation across teams. So the business case is clear to all. They will free up a lot of time spent on this dull work. Uh, but also improve quality and confidence uh, from the consistency of automation. So the different managers for each team agrees to allocate some time to a newly created virtual team for the next three months. One developer from each team is allocated every Friday. With this virtual team, we expect them to make great improvements for all teams to enjoy. This is rarely how any of this works. We will only get a lot of frustration with this approach. As managers, our expectations are high. In our spreadsheet, we have generously allocated four developers a full day every week to this virtual team. And as a member of the virtual team, we know Fridays are not enough. We suspect that we will only scratch the surface, but this was what we could get. And, um, and, uh, and it's better than nothing, right? And also the progress is limited by the overhead of ad hoc collaboration. We still need to do all the ceremonies like backlog, refinement, estimation, etc. because our managers want full transparency into the whole investment. And for example, as a member of the blue team, we actually expect to have normal access to our representative on the virtual team, but now she's unavailable, unavailable on Fridays. So it becomes an improvement theater. We're only mimicking the potentials that we could have reached. I have been on such a team, and if I were to do it again, I would probably focus on solve some problem that makes people's work suck less really quickly. Ask them to celebrate out loud for the uh, surroundings to notice, including their managers. Make sure to translate whatever improvements we, we do on this team uh, in terms of time and money, because that's understandable to all of us. For example, these improvements mean that we don't have to wait for people to become available uh, as a handover, for example. Or we have removed 10 days of rework if, uh, if we have problems with quality. Now, also build trust with the managers or sponsors that, uh, that, that, that make sure that this team exists. 
and uh, such that we have kind of a leeway to focus on harder problems. And later on, I will begin to focus on what kind of API do we have as a team? Are we a platform team? Are we an enabling team? How would team interact with us? Are we, uh, are, are we producing services or is it more like a coaching style or whatever? So it's not about resources, it's, it's about people. It's not about, yeah. Uh, and the last one is the underinvestment in neglecting autonomy. Team autonomy is always a struggle, I believe, but it is nevertheless a real uh, part of uh, excelling as a team. So this quote here, we know from neuroscience research that people are more likely to succeed when they buy into an idea. When people reach their own insights and conclusions, solve their own problems and come up with their own ideas, they are far more likely to own and implement the solutions. So when asking companies, are your teams autonomous? This is often the answer. Yes, our teams are autonomous, but they must use Scrum. They must have a Scrum master and a product owner. And so, so again, how autonomous is that? And by the way, Andrew, just a little curious why this popular framework is missing from most of the big tech companies. Teams with no autonomy to change their own process actually records a lower satisfaction score uh, in the Judge Lee Oros survey here with over 100 uh, respondents. It's not necessarily representative uh, in terms of sample size, but anyway. Uh, or perhaps, uh, yes, our teams are autonomous, but we decide team allocation. And people have a little impact on moving to project and teams uh, that they feel really passionate about. Or we strongly encourage working from the office. So remote, remote, remote work is occasionally tolerated. This is despite the fact that Corona has shown us that we are perfectly capable of being productive from home. And I get that companies require this out of a good heart, heart because they probably want people to socialize, but I don't believe we have to direct teams in order to do so. I, I, I honestly feel that people are, are capable of making that choice themselves or they must use pull requests. But what if teams would rather do pair programming or ensemble programming? It's common to hear the argument, having two or more people solving one problem at a time is too ineffective. And this while at the same time having no concept of the waste that might be introduced in terms of concert switches and the vast amount of weight queues in the in review column essentially limit the flow of work or they must use story points. Uh, they must estimate and can only have them story points. So even worse, we don't need them involved in estimating, estimating their own work. Uh, we'll spare them this activity, but of course, hold them accountable for reaching whatever deadline that, uh, that we defined. Or the last one that our office hours are nine to seven. I mean, working late night is of course, always a welcome spare time activity, right? And don't get me wrong with these. It's not that teams don't have constraints. Of course they have. No teams are islands. So there are guardrails or things that needs to be uh, in a certain way. But just think about it. How much is, isn't is just something that we could let teams decide themselves and get out of their way? So what if we allow people to choose for themselves what project to work on? This will, will, this will definitely have a positive impact on uh, intrinsic motivation. What if we let teams decide where and when they want to work and whether they would like it to be synchronous or asynchronous? What if we, oh, sorry, what if we let teams decide on their own practices and processes? What if we let teams choose their own role and what time of work they are interested in? This must require an insane amount of trust to go this way. So it, might, so it may sound pretty radical. Which is also in the title, actually, of uh, a guy called Matt K. Parker's newly uh, new book that recently came out called Radical Enterprise. But for a lot of enterprise, I think there is still some leeway that allows for more autonomy in teams than what we are currently seeing. So it's not about assigning work to teams for them to complete. It's about giving them the possibility to solve real world problems. Which brings me to my conclusion now. Um, so in order for us to improve our culture, we need to take ownership 
at all levels of the organization and take responsibility for it. We need to continuously invest in culture that is the people in our organization and not by paying whatever annual subscription to some tool promising to solve cultural fixes. Yeah. So invest in your culture so you can grow your business. That would be a better motto than the one from the tool. Thank you. And um, that's it for me. Hey, Dan. Hey. Thank you so much for the talk. And uh, we have some questions coming in. Yeah. Uh, so, do you want to ask your questions, Ilad? Yeah, thank you for that. So then I was, you know, seeing that cultural changes is, of course, extremely dif uh, difficult to do. And I see these changes rooting in the management style, right? Many times I say, sorry for that, but all the transformations are blocked by the middle management. That's what I believe. And again, I don't want to hurt anyone, but that's... I have seen in the last couple of years. But what do you think? How managers can you know, learn to become servant leaders? What is the package, the tools that helps them to, to, you know, to change themselves? That's the hardest part, right? To change yeah. our own behavior. Yes, it is. And I, I, and I believe sometimes it be, it's because we might actually be a little insecure of our own skills, right? As whatever we are, managers or leaders, are we capable of talking about uh, these things with the team or, or do we look silly when we try to approach them in their domain? Um, and to some, I think that insecurity can uh, quickly become, um, look like, uh, like, like more, um, like how to say uh, to authority or whatever we call it that we distance ourselves from it so um to, to answer your question i i think that there needs to be some kind of how can i uh, as a manager or uh, someone who is working closely with teams if i don't have that trust how would i be able to to gain that trust as well so it's not just a team thing to have trust it's also a thing about the collaboration between managers and teams of course does that answer the question or yeah this is good direction nina you have a yeah. question too yes but we got another question as well so oh. I, I will prioritize that one uh, so do you have any recommendations for how to get a team spirit while a, while part of the team is working mostly from home mm. and the rest are in a shared office so probably this hybrid situation yeah, how to yeah, deal yeah, with yeah. that yeah, we uh, those hybrid situations are rarely working, right? I, I mean, I think we have all tried to be the one in, at home, and the rest of the team was sitting in the meeting room, and you were like on the a fly on the wall. So uh, we have uh, we have tried to sometimes when we have gone to 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 companies and said, what would happen if we just were on our desk? all of us and then we were aligned or we were in the same kind of room uh, or situation that we were level again um, but there will always be things when somebody is working from home and the others are at the office we will miss the the talk with uh, the water cooler and and i believe that if we really really want to invest in that we should probably look into how those remote first companies actually are doing that if if, if we will go that way so be much more explicit about uh, we have a, a drop-in meeting here or a hangout or a Teams meeting that we want to socialize in and, and these kind of things. So, yeah, it, the hybrid model is, is, is a challenge. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So there is one more question uh, from Christian Clausen. He asks, how can we make a team autonomous without a big bang? How do you access uh, how much autonomy a team can handle? So two questions in one. Oh, that's a good one. So how much how how much autonomy can can you can you repeat it? How much autonomy could can a team handle? Was that the question? How can we make a team team autonomous without a big bang? So, uh, I, uh, I, we have small steps. <laughs> how do we? <laughs> How would how could we uh, could we could we say that perhaps we have a practice today that they don't actually own? Could we could we could we ask them to own that? 
you say we don't care about how you improve your quality we don't care about how you do these kind of things we believe that that you will do it uh, perfectly fine and I, I and i think if we take such small steps and then are really, really interested in in what they come up with um and then um, and be in a, like a spectator for that um i think magic would happen uh, because suddenly you get ownership of things that you uh, that you previously just have handed over like the requirements from others so small steps typically is a good way of avoiding big pains mm -hmm. thank you very much dan i believe now it's time for us to move to our next speaker thank you dan for jumping in thank Great you work. thank you so much <laughs> thank you bye